Hey everybody, welcome back to more exhaust fabrication at the Red Barn. In this episode, we're going to finish up this side of the headers. Okay, well with uh, the first side done, we're now on to the other side. And a couple things, while the design is essentially, you know, established, let's say. What's important to note is, I don't know if you can tell from here, but this side of the motor, based on cylinder offsets, is farther forward than this side. So what that means is I have to be careful about where, where the collector goes, because as it gets too far back, I gotta make sure that the, uh, the merge doesn't start to interfere with things like you know, the rear engine mount of this cradle. So what that means is, and you can see it again from here, I think I can get a view, maybe not quite. Well, look, the distance between the front of this tube and the mount pickup point compared to the front of this tube and the mount pickup point, you can see it's going backwards like this. So in trying to keep the tubes the same length, these are currently at 21 inches where the other side ended up at 22. Uh, I'm just going to make that up when I cut the pieces, and I'm just going to extend them through here another inch. Uh, I'm chickening out or cheaping out because I already have a little contraption set up down there to hold the collector dummy. And rather than remake it, I know these are all straights. So I'm just going to make sure I remember to add an inch. No big thing. Um, so there we go. Uh, I just quickly used the Ice Engine Works kit again to put everything in place. And now it's the same story of going in and replicating the cuts fitting it in stainless, getting it tacked together, and away we go. So uh, this hopefully, hopefully, will go a little bit quicker. Let's see how we do. Okay, so a couple new things to try here. Lessons learned from last time. So we know this angle iron is a great way to keep this these two tubes completely aligned. Uh, I'm paying a lot more attention to what's going on up here, and I pre-unovalized this curve to get a better fit because I noticed that when we final welded the primary onto the one inch extension, there's a bit of more, you know, more, uh, more overlap or underlap on one side as this met. So I took care of rounding this. We've got it in line here. And then the lesson learned on the tubes not coming in parallel, what I thought I would try this time is I left one tube in plastic that's a, just a lovely, nice, you know, loose fit into the collector dummy. I've got my first stainless tube mock-up, and here I've just got alignment marks so that I can pull this apart. And you can see, I think you can see, how there's an overlap on one part of the connection. It's proud here, and then it's undercut here. That's because this one's ovalized this way, so it's wider in this direction. And this one, because of the twist, is ovalized this way, so it's wider in that direction. So I gotta squeeze them back to round. But to keep the tubes parallel, like I missed on last time, I opted to you know leave this one in here to keep two points of the collector dummy you know in the proper orientation, rotation, and all that. But then just slide other pieces of stainless in here, hose clamp them together so that they're all forced into parallel through the through the collector dummy. All right, I got everything fixtured up. Made another locator for the collector. Duplicated the angle and the position in space of the exit and then locked the collector dummy in place Accounting for all the repositioning based on the cylinder offset Got the first couple pieces of this tube. Well, I got all the pieces of this tube set mitered and deovalized. So now I'm just gonna tack here and here We still need to be able to pull this off and get it out of the way To you know fit other things and make it easier to get to tacking and things like that then it'll all get put back on once everything's in the collector dummy, tacked here, pulled off, final welded. So. So I thought you might find this uh, also helpful. When struggling to get the ovalness corrected, another trick is to squeeze the tubes in the appropriate direction. And this is a little bit of a post-action picture, uh, but 
you can see that I've got these copper lined pliers that I've used to squeeze the ovals in the direction I needed them to go. Sometimes it looks counterintuitive, but it all depends on where the twist is. But anyway, you can see that what that does is it does a much nicer job of getting the walls to be aligned. And then I can sneak in there and get a couple tacks put in place, you know, keep checking around the shape until I get everything right where I want it. And it's working out really well. This is, uh, it's doing a nice job of lining everything up. This part, simple no brainer, it's just keep it straight, get it tacked in preparation for final welding. But there you go, we got the first of the four tubes tacked, fit and tacked, and uh, now it's just continue on and duplicate that into stainless. Okay, maybe this time I'll try to cover a, a couple of other details on this header building. So you can see that most of the model's been replaced. I'm down to a couple of the tricky bits. I'm gonna save this tube for last because it's quite special. Huh, special. Uh, but here's a good example of just, you know, how this really works. I have, this was modeled in here. Uh, and it had a really nice fit and it just gets translated you know translated into stainless as carefully as possible I always cut a little bit long just in case and uh, with that done I've already fit this which you can see the the alignment marks but you know cutting over to, to the stainless it's just it's almost like magic I mean it just it works and uh, now I'm just gonna get some of this stuff tacked together and then I'll go to work on, I'm calling this one, two, three, four. So I wanna get number two tacked. So it is coming right along and as I suspected, this is going a lot quicker, uh, mostly because I feel more comfortable with it now that I've been through it one time. And I apologize for the background noise. The, uh, the wonderful atmospheric river here in California is uh, dumping rain and is blowing wind like mad. So. The red barn is rocking and rolling in that wind. Anyway, so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, keep at this. Here's another sort of obvious and simple thing to do. Anytime I cut it with the bandsaw, it's always good to check to see if it's square in two directions. So that one came out pretty good. And that one came out pretty good. So believe it or not, that's a hand cut on a bandsaw. Well, there's a little bit of a high spot right there. Uh, which I just tune on the belt or the disc sander, but uh, yeah, pretty that swag off-road stand and that Dewalt saw is really quite good. Yeah, it's high right here, so I'm just gonna go touch that up real quick. Okay, so that went pretty well, and you can see that we've got we've got one, two, and four in place, and not final trimmed, but in place. And <laughs> I saved the best for last. This was going to be fun because it's just going to be it's just going to be fun. It's going to be tricky. 
So, uh, yeah, so far so good. Things are lining up nicely, and I'll keep at it and see if I can make this one work. Okay, back at it here, going after this final tricky tube. And I think I got a pretty good fit going using our same get it aligned setup here. But then if you sneak in here, I really think I nailed it on getting that fit. And that's a, what I'm calling a cheated cut. It's not completely true perpendicular to the center line of the bend. Um, just because this is another one of those examples where in the real world, for me anyway, the uh, the plastic model was just not quite exactly what I needed uh, because it's, you know, the full one inch length sections. Again, couldn't have come up with this design without it. Uh, but here we go. So I'm just going to go ahead now and get those two or those three pieces tacked together. Right, that's everything tacked and uh, once again the the kicker there is flat across that plane now you can see there's a teeny gap on this one but that's because of you know rotational I can I can do some adjusting when I go to fit it into the collector but okay there's uh, side side two tacked so I'm happy I'm really happy with that so a couple differences one, you know, and this is the joy of having never done it before. If you look at the gap right here, you can see it's a it's about a finger in a glove width. You know, this one, it's like two fingers in a glove width. And part of the reason for that is if you also look here, this is that whole parallel thing. This tube is really radically not parallel with the engine cradle. And this was the first side we did without sort of paying attention, if you will, to making sure that this was out where it needed to be. So this is actually way too tight. Um, and it's obviously, <laughs> it's a little late to worry about that with everything welded up. And frankly, it, other than, you know, it's not symmetrical with the other side, which you'll never be able to see when it's in the car. Um, you know, I could have, I could have, I would have done it a lot differently. Now that I've done both sides, if I started all over again, I would do it a lot differently. But you can see this side is actually parallel. Now I could have done a better job. You know, here's another lesson learned. I wasn't paying attention to the fact that this wasn't pointed straight up. So I could have pointed this straight up. I could have tipped this one. I could have rotated this one more forward. You know, it's, it's my first time. So actually, when I don't think I can get you a view of this, but this angle is a little bit steeper down than this one. So if I had rotated this up and twisted this down, I could have got a better match. But the good news is they're the same length. So in the end, functionally, we're good. And again, first set of headers, that's lessons learned for me, right? But. I think it's gonna look, it looks like some kind of alien beast. Um, but there you go. So now it's back to uh, pull it all apart and get the welding done on the bench. All right, now I'm gonna start the final welding here of the primaries. I've got the back purge setup going. There's a little secondary valve up there that I reach up and turn on flood the inside with the shielding gas, do the weld, shut it off. It's a little tedious going back and forth, um, but we make do. So there's the first of them. So I'm still working on my TIG. It's getting better, but I got a reasonable heat affected zone. 
and some inconsistencies on the bead, but this is the one that's going to get fully dressed and disappeared, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk through how I do that here in a second. Anyway, so there we go, one, uh, one seam down, and I guess I'm pretty happy with that. So a couple people have asked how about uh, disappearing the welds, and I thought I would just go ahead and do this one and show you how I've gone about dressing these so they are invisible, or as invisible as I can make them. Uh, so regular weld, not that it's unattractive, but um, I just kind of wanted this to look like it was all one tube. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is just go hit this barely with a little three inch uh, sanding disc, not to grind into the parent material and not to try to get the weld all the way gone, but just to move, remove some of, the, some of what's proud of the surface. All right, you can see I just barely barely knock the high spots down. And the thing about the, gr the grinding wheels is if you aren't careful or perfectly careful, you end up gouging into the parent material and leaving uh, you know the telltale dips and stuff and it, it just doesn't look good. This is gonna end up being Cerakoted, so I wanna have as even a surface here as I can. So I'm just gonna use a regular old file and just start going at the welds. And uh, here we go. And the nice thing about this approach is it takes material, it does take material out of the parent, but you can see as it goes from side to side of the tube, across the curve and across the weld, as soon as you're down to a, a level surface, the witness marks from the file are obvious and you know that that section's essentially done. And so move on to another section. I'm getting a little aggressive with the edge of the file just on some of the taller parts. I'm not going to do the whole thing for right now. I'll just take you through the other steps of the process that I follow. And that is just a strip of emery paper. And then I'm gonna go hit this with a DA with 80 on it. All right, and then obviously I'm not done done. You know, I still have to do the backside, but here's the, here's the disappeared weld, right? So you can still see sort of where the, the tube changes shape slightly, but you know, I'm looking at it like right up close too. So relatively speaking, that's a great way to, to dress the welds if you aren't interested in uh, having weld seams showing. So there you go. Okay, that's the last of the primaries welded, and it seems to have gone pretty well. I'm happy with how that's turning out. So now let's get it fit onto the, back onto the engine, work out the final placement, get these tapped. Right, well, we didn't quite get it finished this episode, but we got it mostly finished. All the tubes are welded, the merge bullet's on, I gotta clean up the welds in here, and then final weld, final weld the collector on there. That's just a fit and weld on, and then these joints have to be final welded as well. But I think that's fairly straightforward relative to everything else that's already happened. So we didn't quite get it finished, but we made a lot of good progress. Now it's add the O2 bungs, get it back into the chassis, and work out the rest of the exhaust. I'm looking forward to that too. I hope you're enjoying what you're seeing, and thanks as always for watching. Any questions or comments, leave them down below, and we'll talk to you real soon. Everybody take care.